this is Coffee Number 5. I'm your host, Lara Schmoisman. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Coffee Number 5. Uh, today, I woke up thinking about experience. I There are so many things that I know, and I don't know how I know it. I don't know if this happens to you, but it happens to me all the time. Uh, and like, even I have my team telling me, how do you know that that will happen? And it's not that I have the crystal ball, which I wish I would have, but it's just experience that I can predict that something will happen without, because all the things I did in my life, and it's like, you know, that cause and effect. So there are so many things that they're like that, but some others are not like that. And there is something new out there that it's fascinating. It's absolutely fascinating that it's predictive intelligence. And recently I had the honor and it was a joy to meet an Andy, Andy Godidia. Uh, I think I, I butchered that, but I apologize. So welcome. Thank you, Laura. It's such a pleasure to be here and you pronounced that perfectly. Oh, I did it. Wow. Good. Yay me. Um, so welcome to coffee number five. You are the co-founder and CEO of, of Riveter. Did I say it right? That yeah. one? <laughs> oh my God, I, I did two in a row today. Uh, anyway, so tell us a little more about your company and how you started. And th I want to hear everything about predictive intelligence because I know you, you showed me the platform, which is absolutely mind blowing and and you can help so much businesses about understanding what's going to be successful. Yes, I, I love the story that you started with, right? Because I think that's most most people who have done well in marketing or done well in branding do have a really good intuition. They're, they're able to have that predictive intelligence. Um, but when you think about doing that reliably, thinking about that at scale, that's where having a company like Riveter helping you can really make a difference. Um, so that's exactly what we do. We give predictive intelligence to brands using the visuals that consumers share on social media. And what that means is that we can see products in photos and we can understand what is trending up and down, everything from what she's wearing to what she's consuming no, to- No, 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 no. I'll to give you an example. <laughs> Over my IQ, I think, because this is, this is mind blowing. And when you show it to me, it was even more because Experience is amazing and I really valuable is valuable and I believe in what you just said that experience and that gut feeling because you've been doing it for lo so long, it can help you be successful. But if you have your experience and on top, on top of that tools that you can use, it's you're unstoppable. So give us an example how a brand would use this. Yes, I, I, I think the um, the best way to do that is through a story, right? So. Actually, one of our very first customers was a global um, hair color company, and they were working across Asia. And they said, you know, we're in one part of Asia. We want to understand what's trending in Japan. We want to understand what's trending in Korea. And we can't just rely on our experience and our own intuition uh, to tell us what's going to, to do well in hair color in those two countries. And until they met us, they had been, you know, scanning Google, looking at Google images, copying and pasting images into a lookbook and really just kind of counting uh, what they could see to predict what hair colors were going to go up and down. Um, so they turned to us and said, can you actually give us a way to do this a little bit more reliably, a little bit more methodically? And that's exactly what we did. We looked at social media posts from women and men in Korea and Japan and counted and, and used our system, our computer vision AI, uh, to see what colors, hair colors were trending over time and then predict what colors were going to go up in the future for this company. How, how you could predict this based on seeing how many people are starting to trend in that color is based on trends? Yeah, so we take a little bit of a different approach from kind of traditional social listening. So social listening tools are the ones that, you know, kind of watch hashtags and see what people are talking about. Um, and they just watch uh, the content. We are a little bit different in that we actually look at people. And so we're forming kind of groups of people to watch over time. And what's helpful about that is we can actually identify who the tastemakers are in any given group. So if we want to understand the way trends are moving in beauty in Japan, we've got to follow the tastemakers in beauty in Japan. And through that group, they give us a reliable indication of 
okay, they've predicted this many trends over over the course of history. We trust them to predict trends uh, moving forward. And we do that at, at scale, which makes it really reliable. How long it takes you to do this predictive? Yeah, it's it's completely automated. So we have worked on the company for eight years. We've built an AI engine uh, that can automatically detect that for us. And so really, it's just a matter of asking the machine the question and then seeing the data and, and reporting on it. That's amazing. And I'm thinking because I love trending and I yeah, that's something we do research all the time and see from keywords to hashtags from and imaging trending and visual training is something super new, which yeah. it's great. But how far in, a, in advance can you predict a trend? Yeah, the, so the, the where the visual actually helps us is that it gives us a lot more data um, to rely on. So in fact, we can see indications of tastes and change before people have language to describe it. And so what we'll often find is that we're actually about 24 months ahead of major trend changes. So things like color changes, um, things like ingredient changes um, ahead of, of Google web search and certainly ahead of sales and kind of lagging indicators uh, that we that people usually use to, to form their product assortments. So we get quite a quite a bit of the, the lead time in seeing these things. And but you just mentioned ingredients. That's very interesting because how do you, from the images, you can talk about ingredients? Yeah, there are a couple of things. So one is that our system is able to recognize when things are uh, in packages, right? So we can not only see that someone's talking about when they're having a conversation about vegan, that they're holding up a bottle of shampoo versus holding a plate. <laughs> and those are very different conversations. It would be hard to tell that without the picture. Um, but then we can also actually read the labels on the images. And that also gives us an early indication of things that have been brought to market uh, with these ingredients in them. Uh, I'm, I'm still processing here, but let, let's take it one step further. Let's say I'm a new brand that comes to you. I say, hey, I have it, this very unique ingredient that I'm trying to feature. How can you help me? Yeah, there, there are a couple of things. I think ideally, you know, you, if you are a new brand and you're focusing on a novel ingredient, maybe there isn't a whole lot of conversation about that ingredient for the way that you're using it, right? And so you can't rely on these other things like social listening and Google search to tell you how that's going to go. But you can see where is the conversation right now and who's talking about it. And if I look at those people, maybe they've only talked about it once or twice. But let me look at those people and look at their whole lives. And where does this fit in? What other topics are they talking about? What are their concerns and care abouts? And is there a place for my ingredient to serve those care abouts and concerns if I really believe in this ingredient? So that's kind of one, one side of it. And then the other side, of course, is, uh, is there conversation about it? Is it something that has been, been talked about, but maybe not in the, the way that I'm thinking about using it? Uh, that, that's really smart. I, this is something I always talk to my clients about how we talk about the brand, because it's not sometimes how we talk about the brand because we are the experts in the brand. It's about how people that the consumers are going to be talking about the brand. Yes, 100%. And I think, you know, not just consumers as a whole, but different segments of consumers think about things in different ways. One of my favorite examples that we just looked at was how different generations talk about ceramides as a skin ingredient. And actually, a lot of the marketing to date has been very scientific, very kind of research based. What it turns out that that really resonates with millennials but maybe doesn't resonate as much with Gen, Gen Z. <laughs> so it's kind of, how do we talk about this ingredient in a way that can either bridge the gap or how do we focus on the audience that that does get it? Also, how you initiate the conversation, knowing that in this case, that there are more uh, millennials talking about ceramides, you're going to be using different way, different voice, maybe. That helps you a lot for the brand voice. I think it, it, absolutely, right? The benefits, the things that are important to that group are different and and meeting them where they are and thinking about their care abouts makes a big difference for sure. That go goes by people, what I always talk about, that is creating that deck brand and about really important to determine who's the voice and the, your target audience, that archetype. And that archetype, you cannot have it without having your research. Uh, of course, you can have a gut feeling of who is going to be good feed for your brand, but still there's nothing like data that can confirm that. 
Yes, I, I love surprising our customers right with who their people are because they often have a good instinct on their core and the people that brought them to market, but they may not realize there's a whole other audience for them who maybe even already loves them or is already talking about their brand or their, their hero ingredient. Um, that they could be having a conversation with. And I, I love that you said that because there are so many people that they actually super niche thinking that the audience is so minimal that it's just a certain group of people and they don't realize that other people can benefit from their product too. It goes both ways or some brand is going such a big because they think it's great for the whole market and they're missing out on really creating that conversation for a very targeted audience. Yes, a hundred percent. You know, we, we like to say that good brands create products for communities, right? And that's that that's really the center of it is rather than just kind of creating products in isolation or listening to a to community and creating the product is it's kind of building it around who are these people who are going to love you and your product. So you work with a lot of, I assume, beauty brands, with it, brands. Yes, if you can consume it, if you can wear it, if you can right in and around it. <laughs> Those are the types of brands that we work with. And do you see, because uh, we were, there are a lot of entrepreneurs who listen to your podcast, a lot of uh, business owners. And something that I see as a con constant is what I just mentioned, trying to, and let's be realistic that many times in merging brands, they don't have that huge budget to put advertising or to just spread the world as much as they want to be in the whole world, they cannot do that. So that's where being really intentional makes a difference. Do you see this happening too? A hundred percent. I think, you know, a lot of times brand owners and entrepreneurs have this conflict of, I want to do market research and I want to do surveys and I want to do focus groups, but I don't have the money or probably the time <laughs> to do all these things. But how do I get close to my consumer otherwise? And so I think if we can bridge that gap, make this a really light touch to have an eye on the consumer without having to make those sacrifices and trade-offs, um, then that's that's exactly how brand owners can make smart decisions um, without having to to break the bank. How would we be working with you guys? Would we just having a, a kickoff meeting? How does it work? Or you just give them access to the platform and people are on their own doing their research? Yeah, so right now we do still really like to onboard our customers uh, individually. I think that it's such a new area thinking about where do social insights fit in the rest of my strategy or market research plan is helpful. And I love just talking to people, so, so it's kind of self-interested too. Um, but we do have ways that our but customers- are doing our, their own research. Yeah, exactly, exactly, 100%. We love just hearing what people, what questions people have and what people are curious about. And so I think that's it. Just come with a question of here's who I think I want to look at. Here's the behavior, the interest I think they have. And here's how I fit into their life or, or, or the hypothesis that I have. Um, and then we do the rest. And it can be as quick as, you know, here's this uh, quick report on what's going on with this ingredient in that space. Or it can be a little bit more of an in-depth study on that group and, and on that category. Um, so... This can be one time thing or is something that it needs to be recurrent? That's a great question. It can be both, right? So um, the most important thing I think is that people find a comfortable routine into building insight into their decision making. And so if it's just pre-launch and I just want to validate this before I make these big investment decisions, happy to do it one time. Uh, but we also have a database where our customers can go and search trends and um, see small news articles on what's trending in their space and just stay informed long term. Now, the problem is that for an entrepreneur or a small business owner, it takes a lot of time. It's very time consuming that if you have two weeks, and I talk to people all the time that they try to do it, the do it yourself route. So they spend so much time building an email to go out then or looking for platforms or doing research that then they don't end up doing their job. Yes. Yeah. It's it's a big trade-off for sure. I think, you know, the a lot of the tools and traditional methods out there are very time consuming. If you think about, oh gosh, do I have to read every single newsletter and every single uh, trend alert that comes out and every single magazine like that, that would be in and of a, a full-time, in and of itself a full-time job. And it is, right? There are people who do that for a living. And so I think having a partner to say, I just have this quick question and I'm going to go into my work. Can you provide me a quick answer? 
that's, I that's love true. that. And I love that. That's what I try to do for my clients. Like, hey, I was thinking about this. What do you think? Okay, let me see if we can make it happen or not, the pros and cons, but they don't have to go and uh, integrate themselves. They don't have to go and do it themselves. And many people do this as a side gig. And because they are not there yet to to be able to live their nine to five. Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, there's been a lot of conversation about AI, right? And what does that mean? And how does that change the way we work? And does it does it threaten my job? Does it help me? And this is one of the areas where I think it really does help is we've already seen how powerful it is with something like ChatGPT, where it used to be where I had a question. Maybe I'd spend five, 10 minutes Googling for the answer. Now I have a question, maybe I spend a minute and I get a full essay back on the answer, right? And I think that's what we're seeing in AI. And that's what we're doing with with Riveter as well as I have a quick question and I only want to spend a minute asking it, but I want a really full and rich answer um, in a short amount of time that I can move forward with. So when you get all the research and all the data, how do you see your customers being more successful using this data? I mean, it, it informs their decisions in big ways, right? So all the way from concepting a product and and deciding what should go in it, how it should be positioned at the beginning, to going to market with it, how should it be packaged, what should the experience of um, unboxing and experiencing this product be, and then going to market of which criteria do I need to be thinking about when I'm doing precision advertising or or search or social marketing? How do I... Uh, craft this photo shoot to be as effective as possible, knowing that I only have a certain number of hours with the photographer, <laughs> one model, one one look to put on this model, um, and just being very confident in those decisions and knowing which ones are really going to hit that audience and and do well um, is is everything. It makes a, a big difference in making that turn out well. There are several companies who are very traditional and well-known uh, as a research company. How would you would you say that you compete or you differ from them? Yeah, I think we're we're trying to work with most of them <laughs> and, and, and we have worked with, with big ones. I think a lot of them, one of the big questions that they get asked by their own customers that they have a harder time answering um, is how does Gen Z feel about X, Y, or Z? Because they're not answering surveys. They're not shopping with credit cards in grocery stores. They're not doing watching TV. They're not doing all these things that used to be the basis of this traditional market research. But they are on social media. And not only are they sharing what they want, they expect brands to see that. They expect brands to respect that and hear that and respond to it. Um, and so a lot of them are saying, can you fill this gap in our offering uh, without also sacrificing that quantitative uh, research rigor that we've built a, a name around? Yeah, absolutely. So obviously you're going to say that this is an amazing, really important investment for a new brand. <laughs> yes. I mean, uh, insights are, they can feel like a luxury, I think. And I know that as an entrepreneur myself, right? So when we're researching, just as you said, I spend time talking to people because that's our form of research. We're, we're not, we're also not commissioning large studies or surveys. Um, but just asking the right question at any time is a great habit to build. And so having a partner beside you who you can trust to get you to think in that way and get you to ask those questions, that's what matters most. And and however you know much time or money you throw at a tool or throw at a, a study, it doesn't matter until you have that curiosity and have that approach going in. That's amazing. Well, Andy, it's such a pressure to talk to you. Where people can find you, what they can learn more about your platform. Yes, so they can go to our website, Riveter.com, R-I-V-I-T-E-R. It's misspelled <laughs> from the from the traditional word. Um, and they can email me at Andy, A-N-D-I, at Riveter.com. That's perfect. Well, thank you so much for being here today and to give us all this insight and a look inside AI and how it works and how it can help emerging brands and not so emerging brands who make wise decisions. Thank you so much, Laura. It's been a pleasure. And to you guys, thank you for being here and I'll see you next week with more Coffee Number 5. It was so good to have you here today. See you next time. Catch you on the flip side. Ciao, ciao.